to have you back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, brand, broadcasting live from half around the world to my co-host, Soto Brown, back in Honolulu, Hawaii, and me being here in, uh, near Munich, Germany. And um, we're still in the uh, clause of COVID corona, and we're using this time to look at something that used to run us, which is the hospitality industry, which is pretty much down right now. And we started to find out that some clues for a promising future might lay in the past. And for that, we bring in our guest today once again from his vineyard, uh, Gottsell Vineyards in Napa Valley, uh, Mr. Larry Stricker. Hi, Larry. Hi. Good to have you back. So we're going straight to the first slide, uh, which shows us the beginning of your guys um, covering the world uh, in the uh, resort uh, typology. And this is how it all started back on the island of Oahu in Hawaii with um, Conrad Hilton and uh, your friend and business partner and colleague Edward Killingsworth. And this is the Kahala Hilton. And uh, our uh, additional uh, consultant here, uh, exotic escapism expert Susanna, uh, and us have been talking about how innovative and also provocative and risky that project was, because way back it was uh, far, far away from uh, the booming Waikiki at its time. So if we can get the first slide, uh, the second slide up here. Uh, this, this shows us not only at the top right how far away it was, because in the distance of that picture, you can see one of our iconic um, uh, out of practice uh, volcanoes, Diamond Head. And uh, we've been zooming in on this picture here because sometimes for the general audience who's not, we're not architects, it's easier to identify uh, the zeitgeist through automotive than through architecture, which often looks timeless, as in best cases, as in this case here. But here we have, I mean, you just sort of told me this is a 1964 Chevrolet, right? 65 Chevrolet that's, that you see oh, the, the white car in the, in the lower left corner. So this would have been a yeah. few years after the hotel opened. Exactly, yeah. So uh, going to the next slide, um, per our pedagogy and methodology of using vehicles as zeitgeist um, elements, um, here is uh, my, you know, me as a German, I'm an Americano, so I love what we call Straßenkreuzer, which are the street cruisers, the big boats that only you Americans were able to make. And this is one of the last ones. This is my Lincoln Town Car. It made sense when I was still living in the prairie and in the desert to some degree because I needed some enclosure to protect me from the extremeness of the elements. Not so much more in Hawaii. That's why I traded it into our PI mobile, our easy breezy one that you just sort of kindly take care of. Yes. And uh, this was parked uh, in front of uh, Leahi, or on Leahi Street, in front of Leahi, uh, how uh, Hawaiians called Diamond Head because it reminded us of the shape of uh, of a fish of, of that the, name. Yeah, the eye. And fish. why I. Exactly. And why do I bother you with my big boat? Because it was built the same year as the project we're going to talk about today in 1993. So let's go to the next slide. And you just sort of tell us more about uh, the top picture, please. Well, there's an aerial photograph of Diamond Head, or Leahi, as you just pointed out, and as you can see, it's a crater with an empty part in the middle. This is an old photograph, as we noticed, because there are no high-rises yet in Waikiki that we can see at the top of the picture, but if we look beyond that Waikiki area, in the far distance, we see the Waianae Mountains, and that takes us to the location of the hotel, or the structure we're going to talk about today, at Koolina, and that is the Ihilani Hotel, which we see in the bottom picture. So from Diamond Head and Waikiki, we go traveling out to the Waianae Coast to look at this hotel in detail. And that's an interesting similarity, uh, Larry, right, in many ways between the Kahala yeah, I think and the, uh, the parallels between the Kahala 
being, you know, further to as far from the airport to the east as as uh, Ihilani is from the airport to the west. But they were both, uh, you know, rather uh, they were the first hotels in, in in a very isolated area, and they they had. Uh, I, I know it, it took a while for uh, for Ihilani to to gain some some recognition, and uh, the, the first uh, year it was principally uh, uh, used by the the staff of Japan Airlines. So it, it, uh, we we forget uh, that the Kahala also had some a rough first year and and with room rates at a, at a Terrible low of of twenty five dollars a night, so it's it's amazing how things have progressed. The, the other okay. interesting comparison uh, to Kahala is that uh, when our our client uh, from Japan Airlines, uh, Chuo Kojima, he, when I first met him, he, he said they had researched several resorts in in Hawaii and. Uh, Fortunately, they were all designed by the same architect, so that's why we were selected. And, and of course, the Kahala being Kahala and uh, Halakalani, Manalani, and, and Kapalua was still uh, still around back then. Yeah, and that reminds us of a of a survey, a ranking that uh, your friend and partner Ron Lindgren had shown us in one of the last shows. Uh, with uh, Wellness World, World of Wellness, which, as I recall correctly, um, actually was from the early 90s, which exactly represents that you guys were topping that list with uh, with these four projects in the world. They were all by you and uh, all, all in Hawaii. So, yeah. um, next slide. Next slide is our mandatory uh, biochromatic environmental check. As we have pointed out, that your projects, uh, I would say, intuitively, if not intentionally, were very uh, ecolo ecologically conscious and successful. So here again, the, the Google Map with the North Era, and you pointed out, Larry, that you obviously designed it to optimize the, the views, which you know almost every uh, sort of prime uh, location shorefront uh, project does, but at the same time, they're also all very, very easy breezy in the hotel rooms. And why that is, we go to the next slide. Yeah. And you, uh, Larry, tell us a little bit more about what we see. Well, we see the, the, the extra large lanai's on, on all the guest rooms. And and here we're, we're seeing on the uh, where the guests are standing there, the open railings, and uh, just above that, the uh, the planter uh, railings, uh, or the the railing, uh, the lanais with uh, the landscaping landscape planters in them. And uh, as as from our previous experience, we we found that we during when when the value engineering comes along. We, we lose half of the planter, so I, I, I just looked at my original rendering of the Ihilani, and I did show planters on every floor. So we were able to retain half of them and still come out a hero in, in helping save costs on the construction. This is a very great advice to the uh, to the emerging generation. You got to shoot high, you know, shoot the highest, so then. Still be happy with what you get after value engineering, and we threw in the, the top uh, slide quotation from from previous shows, which shows from left to right, it's sort of uh, organic evolution from uh, that. Actually, the Kahala had rather small openings. There were still significant opaque pieces uh, left and right of of the the floor to ceiling uh, sliding doors. And then slowly but surely through Ron Talikalani and then maxed out in your case, you got it bigger and bigger to, in, in your case, to 100%. So these are truly the largest lanai and the largest openings to lanai that, that you can have on, on the island, which is really uh, uh, spectacular to have. Uh, go to the next slide. 
Um, we, what we see is, because you guys design it obviously from inside out as much as from outside in, and as Suzanne was uh, always reminding us that the kind of renovation intervals in the, in the hospitality industry are like five to seven years. So at the bottom left, we see when it was still under the Marriott uh, ownership, and that was a renovation, I think, in 2011. And then on the top right, we see the most recent renovation when uh, Four Seasons took over. And we're happy to say and to illustrate that uh, substantial things have stayed unchanged. You still got the same large sliding doors to the lanai, and you even got the wooden uh, sliders, uh, the, the French wooden sliders, which is great. We're using, again, uh, the automotive to point something out because, uh, and this is relative to the, to the great achievement of having stayed pretty true to the, to the uh, original authentically. But I was looking for, when you look at the backdrop of the, of the bed at the top right, um, I was looking if there had been a woody Lincoln Town Car, but there wasn't any. The only Woody that you got in the 90s was the, uh, the one that you see um, up there at the, at the top left. So, we, we, you know, we, we wouldn't call this heavy-handed as you had to with a Mamalani renovation, but still, uh, we would advise at the next renovation, which then obviously would occur in, you know, five to seven years, even not do these things, but keep it rather even cleaner. But you had an interesting background story about the original interior that was also rather troubled and challenging, right? There you yeah, go. Yeah, I, I think the uh, our, our original uh, client rep from Japan Airlines, uh, the group was called Pan Pacific Hoteliers, and they they uh, were inspired by. The Kahala and, and particularly the Hala Kalani and, and wanted to achieve that level of, of success. However, during the design process and the development of the hotel and, and ec economic functions within, uh, Nico Hotels uh, took, took over from this Pan Pacific group and it ended up being more of a uh, you know, not not the luxury level that it, we had designed the hotel for, and then uh, Marriott uh, came and took it over from Nico and and brought the level up a little bit, but then it's come full circle now with Four Seasons and it's it's back to the level of luxury that we originally designed. Mm -hmm. and that's well deserved. So let's go to the next slide and talking evolution. While the Kahala was a very sophisticatedly but still a double loaded corridor, the evolution in you guys' work actually uh, was shifting to way more tropically exotic uh, um, single loaded corridors, um, as we have seen in the Palm Desert Hotel up there and in Yamanalani. And uh, then in the Ihilani, uh, the Ihilani has this great uh, central courtyard atrium that we can see here. And that's not only uh, open to the very top with a, with a glass roof, but also uh, open, as we see here, towards the Mauka, towards the mountain. And when um, I took this picture here together with your friend and partner, Ron Lindgren, because when he was there for the Docomomo Symposium, we were cruising out there. And, and catching it sort of at this beautiful uh, sunset light and we took the picture here. And I witnessed, I was sneaking close to the windows, I can see some of them still being able to be slid open so you can actually get some pretty nice breeze through if you want, so you can get cross ventilation. And that's the most important thing under the current virus that we have because outdoors you're safe, indoors there's trouble. So you were ahead of the game, Larry. Thanks for that. But we also we also want to point out go back to the to the uh, vegetated planters because while in the desert palm hotel and also in the um, in your Manalani, we were sad to not having seen them operated anymore. So planted here, thanks to the Four Seasons and kudos, uh, they're still doing it. So we're very happy to see that that they want to see the legacy alive you know, up to its detail. So thanks to the hotel management. Uh, next slide. Okay, DeSilva, you want to kick in here? Well, 
When the uh, Ihilani Hotel was first built, there was the plan that that entire area of Koalina was going to become a resort complex like Kahanapali on Maui. But because of economic reasons, uh, most of those planned hotels never got built, and Ihilani was just there by itself for a great many years. And lacking the synergy of other hotels, it made it less occupied than it might have been otherwise. But finally, in about 2011, the Aulani Resort opened next to it, and that obviously is run by Disney. So we go from the stripped-down, bare-bones, honest concrete of Ihilani to next door this very artificial, faux-tropical concoction, which being created by Disney is supposed to be a fantasy. It is supposed to look like a fantasy location, which in fact it does. Personally, I find it not very appealing. Um, The exterior has these faux wood details that really aren't wood, and these kind of A-frame, thrusting, Polynesian-inspired roof that are kind of tacked on to what's essentially, obviously, just a big concrete box. So personally, um, I don't think those two make very good neighbors. However, that is the way they have worked out, and it is undeniably helpful for there to be more than one hotel rather than Ihilani all by itself. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with you, DeSoto. <clears throat> Well, that's a good example of what happens when you throw your design guidelines away. Yeah. Because they, when we originally uh, started uh, uh, Ihilani, the de- design guidelines were really uh, very stringent and, and uh, dictated a, uh, a terracing of the buildings so they weren't all one height. And it appears that uh, they allowed... Uh, Disney to proceed with without following the guidelines. I think you're right. Yeah, and I find it almost ironic because you know when Ed started out with what one called structural expressionism, that the Kahala, you know, Hilton with the sticking out bones exemplifies the best. You were slowly but surely almost like nature does with creatures, with birds, things that aren't really that necessary anymore. You know. They go through the backgrounds, and so you you did in, in large parts. While at the same time, uh, architects of why I guess were the ones who, who did this here were were doing kind of the opposite. In, in as you perfectly said, uh, the sort of in a silly way. So it goes from according to Ron structural expressionism to sort of a fake regionalism, which is kind of really ironic. But anyways, so hopefully it doesn't happen again, although we have some fears to share in the volume two uh, yeah. of, of this show. What's going to happen next? So it might get worse. So or yeah. along the same lines of sort of an extended postmodernism. But let's go to the next slide and lift up the spirit a little more, because here we are in, in some parts. You have been showing and sharing again the structural expressionism at, at its best and here in the sort of very most elaborated way of the quadruple bundle of columns uh, that, as Ron said, this is the, old, the most ultimate where the beams can just slide through the columns here. So very fine. And that's in the pool area here. And the next slide shows a, a detail of it at nighttime. And I threw in this sort of quote to one of the Polynesian pop uh, shows we've, we've been doing the solo. And while here it's staying away from doing it too literally, I believe that figuratively you do it very well. The, the way the light comes through and the combination of water and plants is indeed very tropical exotic, but with contemporary means. Yes. So that's much appreciated. Yes. So the uh, the quiet columns really tie back to one of the original projects that I worked on, which was the Kapalua Bay Hotel. If you if you go back and look at the lobby columns there, uh, some very similar uh, in structure. Absolutely, and while the the most crime being that that one was torn down to replace it with something equally hideous to what we were just talking about, uh, we get to that in a little bit too. Again, uh, this one here is is then 
uh, continuing that legacy of the quadrupling columns. Yeah, absolutely. And next slide uh, shows us how cleverly that theme has been sort of um, explanated and then alternated here while in the core of the building where the most loads are, you had basically given the quadruple columns a solid core with these reveals uh, on, on the outside, very clever. And you said, Larry, that probably the way the, the columns meet the ground uh, is a result of one of the renovations, and you don't recall that that had been your detailing. So I basically yeah. say, next time, guys, when you remodel, uh, please consult Larry as far as uh, the fine grain. I think in the in the main structure with the most recent uh, Four Seasons renovation, they did add wood in the recessed area of the quad columns, which accentuate the, the four columns. So that that was a nice a nice touch too. Yeah, yeah, and we will see that later actually in the vault too on the show. But let's go to the next slide, and you, Larry, share with us where that is. That's where the, the columns meet the ground there at the entry. And uh, again, this was a much tighter site than, than the uh, other, say, than, say, the Monolani. Monolani was 30 acres, and this, this site was just under 8 acres. So it, it much, mm-hmm. much more dense as far as the, the guest rooms, but still, uh, still the, the, uh, the, the driving force was was to create uh, almost 100% uh, guest rooms with, with views to the ocean. Yeah. And while we were very sad to see that sort of tropical exotic lushness of vegetation and water having been uh, taken away in the Manalani and also in the, in the entrance area, we want to recognize and appreciate that it's still there here in the Ihalani, although I can only imagine that probably the way how the water met the column was was uh, was solved in a more elegant way and probably it didn't have that extra plinth down there. So again, I think overall, the Ihalani has, um, which by the way, we want to mention here, is a young timer. So it's only 25 years, so a quarter of a century young. So it's far away from being on the register, uh, um, but it's, it's getting there, so uh, you can't start early enough to really uh, treasure a killing's worth, uh, and which they have been doing. But again, yeah. try to do even better in the detailing, I guess, is our wish. <laughs> uh, go to the next it slide. Appears, it appears that the water level is, is uh, about six inches too low in that photograph. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That's an easy way. Thanks for that. So, key guys, consulting Larry wouldn't cost much. Yeah. Just pour in a little bit more water. He has really a very economical solutions. And explain to us how the columns go up here to accentuate the entrance in this in this great uh, entrance feature here. Well, I, I think it's it's a matter, you know, in, in the was we look at this in, in scale to the, the six-story Manawani, which had similar port cochere. We're, we're looking at a much higher building, and then again to to create this terracing effect, we we do the, the same thing. There was also uh, from from the entrance here considerable wind, so we we uh, designed the entry to to minimize the the wind problem. I, th- I think that the last time I was out there, we we originally had uh, the, the old revolving doors, but I think uh, it would be uh, the Four Seasons renovation they they've done to just pairs of sliding doors that uh, that apparently work fine. But the, that is, is mm-hmm. one one uh, it, it can get windy out at this end of the island. Yeah, it that was I was going to say that is a very windy location where this hotel happens to be, but I also wanted to say about this particular picture, I don't think I've ever been at the hotel at night to see the lighting, which really accentuates those different levels that have been added here that have been put in addition to the main port cochere itself, and they look really dramatic, and they are very eye-catching. 
Yeah, and complement and again to the architects of renovation, they were enhancing existing features that you have designed, Larry, rather than adding some on their own. And we will find out more why that was and who are the authors behind in our volume two of the show. And let's phase down and go to the next slide, which is the second to last, which, um, you know, while we were talking, uh, Ed having started out as an century modern guy where everything was square, boxy, rectilinear, uh, you already shared with us uh, that the zeitgeist and also the zoning embodying the zeitgeist had forced you to do different things. And I recall uh, Ron saying, and that's why I was uh, uh, inserting here that quote to the show that Harvey Keller did with Ed that you guys should watch online, that um, he, um, uh, Ron said that, that Ed wasn't particularly fond of you guys basically uh, how should one say, um, sort of differentiating the box, so the kind of the stepping down and also the pitch roofs, obviously. But again, you guys were the next generation, and you had to smuggle your big uh, modern agenda, not only through postmodernism, but also what had to come after that, which is the early 90s, and that's the time I had to go to school, and that was the most devastating a lot of times because we didn't know where to go. So you guys were just uh, keeping the course, steering on course, and, and only slightly. And I want to, if you don't mind sharing with us the little eye-winking detailing of uh, the, the little Zoom slide piece that I show at the top right, area. Uh, well, the, again, some of, some of this terracing was, was dictated by the design guidelines, which had to do with the height a year to the setbacks, and then uh, a lot of it was was functional. Uh, when you when you do stepping back, it's it's always interesting how you carry a exit stair down a terraced building. So that that's what we're seeing at the uh, at the far right uh, or far left edge of the stepping, and that, that's crowned with a uh, with the residential suite and a swimming pool up uh, with a, or a posting beam uh, trellis work around it. So it, it all it all works to with the stepping of the building and, and the and the terrace lies. Mm -hmm. And talking swimming pool uh, besides the big lagoon here, which is a large natural pool that gets us to the last slide which uh, shows us the, the main swimming pool on the, on the ground level. And, and again, explain to us a little bit uh, the, 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 the relationship between the Hale Kalani and the Igi Lani. Mary. Yeah, our, our, the, the rep who was kind of the prime mover for Japan Airlines was, was, was really in awe of the luxury and the quality of uh, of Hala Kalani, and he, he wanted to emulate that uh, in every way possible. And that's that's one of our philosophies that, that continues uh, through all the years of our firm, that, you know, you, you, you don't have to be different, you just have to be good. And, and uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, an architect sits down and says, what can I do differently? And, you know, if, if uh, the only thing you can do is, is improve on what you've done in the past. I think that's, that could be a better closing note for, for this show. You don't have to be different. You just have to continue to be good and be bad. So, right. <laughs> Thanks so much for that message. So uh, there's more to come. We're going to contemplate more on this year masterpiece, the final killing tour on the Hawaiian Islands. And until then, uh, please all stay as easy breezy and as easy breezy as you, Larry, Ron, and Ed. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.